Now that we've discussed the basics of ground state electron configurations uh, as you would have seen it in GenChem, let's look at some more of the famous exceptions to these types of rules that we introduced there. So I've got a specific part of the periodic table here, specifically the part where we're adding to the 4s shell and then the 3d shell and then the row below it, um, 5s and 4d, so part of the s block, part of the d block, and then the p block being over here. And if we have the configuration of potassium, okay, we'd start by saying, well, that's argon, the noble gas from uh, the third row, which ends over here in the P block. Then starting the fourth row, we have potassium, which has argon's configuration with a 4s1 added to it. Then for calcium beyond that, we just add that second electron into the 4s orbital. So we have 4s2. And then, as you would expect, filling in um, the D block here, we have scandium, which starts adding in electrons into the 3D <coughs> shell there, the 3D subshell. Then you'd have 3D1, 2, 3. And you would expect to have 3D4 at chromium. And you're probably, you've probably seen this exception before, that for chromium, we do not have what we would have expected based off of just the standard type of Aufbau principle here. We have 4s1, 3d5. Okay, then similarly, we'd go on, we'd have uh, 4s2, 3d5 at manganese, 3d6, 7, 8, and we might expect 3d9 at cobalt, or that is not cobalt, that is copper. Let me fix that. Cu, copper. Okay, so we'd have copper again being an exception where we have 4s1, 3d10. <clears throat> then zinc rounding out this subshell at 4s2, 3d10. Okay, and you'll notice a similar thing if you go to molybdenum or silver. They have uh, similar exceptions to that rule where they have uh, their respective noble gas, the noble gas at the end of the fourth row being krypton. And then they have 5s1, 4d5 for molybdenum. And for silver, you have the krypton configuration. Then you have 5s1, 4d10. And in contrast to the expected 5s2, 3d9. Okay, so just what the heck is going on here? So the standard uh, expectation of what we would have is we have our s orbitals, which are lower in energy here, our 4s. And then we have our 3d orbitals here, slightly higher in energy. And according to the standard outbot principle, we would fill electrons in the 4s first. And we would say electron 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six if we had six electrons in our in our uh, valence shell as we did for chromium here okay but that uh, doesn't actually happen and instead we get a configuration for 3d 4s where we have something like the following where we have one two three four five our six electrons are 4s1 and 3d5 so the explanation that's generally given in general chemistry about this for why this is the case is that uh, they say half-filled subshells are exceptionally stable. And uh, now that we've looked at this in a deeper level, our, our goal in this course is to look at things like electron configuration, the, the behavior of atoms and molecules at a deeper level than general chemistry. So now that, since we've studied Hartree-Fock, we know that each electron has its one electron energy, which is the kinetic energy and potential energy uh, tr attraction to the nucleus in its given orbital. And then it has interactions with the other electrons as well, uh, coulombically. So those coulombic interactions occur through both exchange and uh, through both coulomb and exchange interactions. And we know that for same spin electrons, you have both the Coulomb and exchange interaction, but for opposite spin electrons, you have only the Coulomb interaction. There's no exchange between uh, opposite spin electrons because of how the, integral, the exchange integrals work out. So we actually have uh, exchange interactions between all of, 
of these electrons now when you have them all uh, in the same spin. So I'll spin up as I have them listed here. Whereas in this configuration, there's a spin down electron, so there it doesn't have a, an exchange interaction with all of these other electrons. And uh, we know that that's all of the energy in terms of in terms of Hartree-Fock is just one electron and two electron energy. So it must be the case that promoting this electron from the 4s uh, orbital here up to the 3d in energy, uh, the energy it costs to do that must be less than the exchange energy you gain back by having the exchange interaction with this electron uh, with all the other electrons there. Okay, so that's all well and good. Um, what about the other case where we have this uh, 4s1 3d10 or 5s1 3d10? Well, that would be a similar situation. We can draw up both cases. We can either have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then having 3d9, having that last d orbital open or we can have all 10 orbitals in the D shell there. And again the argument from general chemistry would be that full, fully filled orbital subshells and half filled subshells are exceptionally stable and up here you have one which is completely filled and then one which is neither half nor full and up here you have one which is completely full and one which is uh, half full. Okay, so again, these these orbitals are close enough in energy that they're that the energy of promoting this electron from this 4s orbital here up to a 3d, or from a 5s up to a 4d, that the energy you lose by promoting that to a higher energy uh, must be made up for by some type of different Coulomb and exchange interactions, but you occur here. The same type of argument that I would have uh, proposed over here doesn't doesn't quite work the same way over here because um, if you count up the same number of uh, ex you have the same number of uh, spin up and spin down electrons in each case uh, this electron didn't this electron was spin down when it was in the s orbital and it's spin down in the d orbital so that obviously doesn't work as an explanation for that but um, you have uh, this is an an example of how things are getting more complicated as you go to larger and larger atoms that that type of intuition about the way orbitals behave in the hydrogen atom uh, goes further and further away from uh, what we actually observe when you get to larger and larger atoms farther and farther down the periodic table. And these are the type of exceptions which occur in the D block. Once you get down to the F block in the lanthanides and actinides, uh, things get even crazier. You can have S and P and D orbitals that are all subshells, which are all partially filled and get filled in weird orders uh, as you go along. Then there's one more thing I want to talk about with respect to this, uh, which is a really strange exception before uh, we move on to something else. And that's when you ionize transition metals. So if I take something like, let's say, iron, iron in its ground state would be 4s2. Well, let's make sure we add in our argon, 4s2, 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But for iron 2 plus, for the uh, for the doubly ionized cation of iron, you expect in ionization that you remove the highest energy electron. So since we filled the 4s orbital first, you would expect that we would remove we would remove the orbital from the d. You would we would remove the electron from the d orbital. But in fact, when you ionize transition metals, you ionize the s orbitals first. So the iron 2 plus or iron 2 cation has a configuration of argon 3d6 we have lost the s electrons so we go from a situation where we have our five our set of d orbitals and our s orbital here we've gone from a situation where we have one two three four five six one, two, three, four, five, six in the in the d orbital, to a situation where we have lost our s electrons. 
And this doesn't seem to make sense because when we have our potassium and calcium, we filled those S orbitals first, so they had to be lower in energy then. But iron has a higher nuclear charge. Iron has six more protons in there. And it also has a different number of electrons. And when you have different numbers of protons and electrons in your nucleus, orbitals can change energy relative to each other. So not only could it be the fact that once we get into the uh, transition metals here, once we get into the D block, we could have our D orbitals and our S orbitals switch places as in terms of which one is lower in energy. But not only that, but when we, move, when we remove electrons, all of the other orbitals relax as well. So we go from having a neutral iron, which has a nuclear charge of 26 and 26 electrons, to our iron cation, which has a charge of 2 plus, which means it has a nuclear charge of 26 and 24 electrons. So you might expect that iron 2 plus might behave the same as, let's see, going back to in the periodic table here, you might expect that iron 2 plus behaves the same as chromium because it has 24 electrons and chromium has 24 electrons. But chromium's nuclear charge is 24 and iron's is 26. So there, it doesn't necessarily mean that something with 26 protons and 24 electrons will behave the same as uh, 24 protons and 24 electrons. Uh, each changing nuclear charge and each uh, different number of electrons uh, can certainly have different uh, possible values for what all of these orbital energies are. And it just so happens that when you remove an electron from a d orbital in iron, that costs more energy than removing an electron from an s orbital in iron. So uh, these are some things to keep in mind that the kind of picture of orbitals having some fixed energy and then just adding in electrons to them or removing them isn't really the case how it works. We would solve the Hartree-Fock equations. We would solve for the orbital energies of the iron 2 plus ion and then solve it for the iron atom itself. And we would just see whether having whether having a an electron removed from the 4s orbital or from the 3d uh, subshell would have the largest change in energy and uh, and which one would result from that so these orbitals uh, d have the ability to relax when we do things like change the number of electrons and change the nuclear charge